like everybody i also have my inspiration i'm sure you have yours many people in my life have inspired me i've met people learned things but as far as what i'm doing now and for what i'm going to speak today my motivation and my inspiration had in my life had started very young with my grandfather my grandfather was a forest ranger and i grew up in an atmosphere where i learned to uh, respect the relationship between man and the animal at a very early age this is a picture uh, of my grandfather holding one of my uncles uh, that was way back in 1954 him uh, on a patrolling duty and my uncle's mother and their friends enjoying on an elephant at home so i grew up in a very similar atmosphere where i also learned to be with the animal with the mahot with uh, the other people in the forest department so the mutual respect started very young but for different work because i'm a tour operator by profession so it took me outside but the love for this national park uh, manas national park which is very close to where i live uh brought me back now coming back to this place and what i'm going to talk today is power of a community to bring change change in the system change into themselves and also change the way people think about conservation in many parts of the world manas national park it's a unesco world heritage site it's a national park it's an important bird area it's a biodiversity hotspot it's a tiger reserve and an elephant reserve so it has so many attributes but in spite of that because of certain reasons which was political unrest it got into a very bad shape the manas uh, was in moral heritage site in danger list for more than 15 years because of this agitation led by the boro tribal ethnic community for their own political identity the entire infrastructure of uh, beat offices inside the park were destroyed arms were snatched away so literally there was no law there was no guards nobody could do anything and so the poachers and the timber fellers they had a head and they could do anything they wanted to and to the extent that they had killed all the rhinos that were there in manas and it went into the, the, the list of manas world heritage site in danger this is where i uh, met some of those ex poachers who had been actively involved in those things that i had just spoken about and we did a film i would like to take you through the first few seconds of that film mor naam serhan mosari mor naam buddhishur boro jason bosumotari agor shikari korisulu shikari bara horin hatti marisu hatti rostaman marisu mor hat agor ta shikarot jawa humayot গাহরি খাইছি কেতিয়াবা হাতিও মারে খাই মার খাই কেতিয়াবা বারা কেতিয়াবা পহু এগুলাখান মারে খাই হাতি পঁচিশটান হয়েছে আর গাহরিটো হিসাবই নাই আর হরিণবিলাকটো হিসাব নাই দ্যাট ওয়াজ দ্য স্টোরি অফ মানাস টিল অ্যারাউন্ড টু থাউজেন্ড ফোর নাও দিস ওয়ার দ্য পিপল হু লিভ অন দ্য ফ্রেঞ্জ এরিয়াজ অফ দ্য ন্যাশনাল পার্ক মোস্টলি কনসিস্টিং অফ লোকাল বোরো ট্রাইবেল পিপল a shooters they knew how to make guns forget about how to shoot a gun the entire village probably knew how to make guns there was a time when you wouldn't get any half inch pipe in that area because those were used for making guns timber felling that uh that finished all the they cut down all the trees that was worth any value on the indian side and they were started cutting trees on the bhutan side of the border they were shaw mills being put up, put up inside the core area of the national park by that time what happened one development the political settlement of the boros were reached in 2004 after a ceasefire in 2003 and the boro territorial council uh, some kind of right to self rule was given to uh, the boro community and the boro liberation tigers which was the armed wing they surrendered and formed came into the political mainstream and formed a government 
this is when the intervention started and this was also the time when Kaziranga as well as Manas was attaining its centenary year. We had a huge fanfare and celebration as far as Kaziranga is concerned, but for Manas it was the beginning of a new hope. And the hope started with a small NGO of the local communities called the Manas Mauzig and Ecotourism Society. And this society consisted mostly of those ex-poachers, ex-insurgents, ex-APSU volunteers, and they were patronized, they were given the platform to organize themselves by the local Allboro Students' Union. Uh, this is actually a uh, wooden placard in front of the National Park, which is being posted by the Manashtra Mausik and Ecotourism Society in the early days of their functioning. Now, what they started doing is, they started a community-based conservation model. Now, why is it that this model succeeded and many mo other models failed? This is a big question because this during entire of this 15, 20 years of destruction that has happened in Manas, the other organizations were very active. You know, there were national and international NGOs who were active in trying to tell people why we should preserve and why we should conserve, why we should not kill the animals. But there was one basic disconnect which was missing while trying to communicate with the local communities. This is where I would like to take you to this picture of this gentleman. His name is Nick Herbert. He was then the Shadow Secretary of State for Environment and Forest in UK. He had uh, actually come to Assam and asked for a meeting with us. And he wanted to know why our model has succeeded and where many other models have failed. So when we explained to him how we had done it, he actually defined it as incentivized conservation. So what is incentivized conservation? So for a poor fellow who's living on the fringe of the national park, the forest is his backyard. So this is where he probably gets his daily needs like firewood or maybe some vegetables. There are a lot of wild herbs there. To tell him not to go and use that part of the forest, he wouldn't understand. He doesn't know what it is, why we shouldn't go there. So he was at a relative disadvantage when the forest department comes and tells him he should not do that. But nobody came and told him what alternative ways he has. So the easiest thing for him was to pick up a gun, shoot a rhino or a deer, or an elephant, and earn some money. And most of the time, it, they were not the ones who were getting mostly paid higher. It was the others in the chain who get paid more. And they were just the henchmen, you know, the front frontal guys who were doing that. So the NGO started this process of going into the villages and identifying the hardcore poachers in the society because this NGO was from the local community. They have formed it themselves. So they knew in the amongst the community like who was into poaching, who was, into no, was not. So they identified the hardcore ones, went into their families, created social pressure, and that's how they convinced them to give up arms. So those talk of arms that you saw, we at one point of time, we had 47 of those handmade muzzle loaders called Gazimara, which we finally gave it to the district administration later. Now, the model that this NGO was suggesting was of alternate livelihood creation. The first model, first that we what first thing that we tried is all these boys that you see are actually ex poachers, but right now what they're doing, this is uh, this is in early 2005, they're being put into conservation duties. The NGO mobilized them and NGO used the, their knowledge, their expertise to come and do patrolling for the uh, in the national park. This is actually on the patrolling duty. And this was the next phase when it got more organized. We started getting them uniforms and other things. So gradually it, it, it was a process. So both the shots are actually of patrolling, but at different <laughs> times of the year. So if you look at these boys, these are the same people, you know, with the uniform and the gun, you could mistake them for one of the insurgents or the terrorists. But these are simple village people who lives in those areas with a little guidance and proper training. They started doing very effective work of conservation of the national park. Then the other model was like the ecotourism model. We started telling those poachers that why shoot with the gun? If you kill with the gun, you only earn once. So if you help tourists shoot with their cameras, you can probably earn again and again by showing the same animal. Because the kind of expertise they had, they knew the forest like the palm of their hands. They could tell you like uh, animal has passed 
by this area at this hour, or this is the size of the animal, or this is from this family. So they could actually remember and relate to almost everything on in that area. So with that expertise, this was the local ethnic cottages which was created and created by the community and run by the community with intervention of us. Now, this effort has been recorded and been appreciated by the UNESCO World Heritage Center as well. Because way back in 2007-8, the UNESCO had sent a mission to verify whether to keep the World Heritage Site tag intact or to remove. So we all knew there was a re real danger of Manas losing that status. And two very important gentlemen, one from IUCN, which governs all the World Heritage Sites of, of natural wonder in the world. Uh, Mr. David Shepherd, he came in. This is his remark. And the second one was Dr. Kishore Rao. Dr. Kishore Rao currently is the Director General of UNESCO World Heritage Center. So he's, he's the boss of World Heritage in the world as of today. So these two gentlemen came on a verification mission. And when they went back on their report, which is on a public domain on the UNESCO site, it mentions that everything in Manas has been destroyed but there's still hope. And they appreciated this community-based ecotourism initiative started by this local NGO in association with two organizations, Ashoka Holidays, where I, which I used to work. And they re recommended this to be replicated in the other parts of the national park. So today, in the model of this, there are 18 other organizations, totaling total 19 organizations, which forms a buffer all along the boundary of the national park. And this is how the, um, uh, the lost glory of Manas was restored by the community themselves, who at one point were responsible for the destruction. So current status of Manas is, Manas is well protected now. It has, it has regained the World Heritage Site tag that was in 2011. So tourists have started coming. The new resorts have been built up. Uh, new routes are being opened. These are some conservation programs which are happening. Now, what about those people who are involved? Like Mausi Henry, as I said, there are 18, 19 other organizations. 300 of the, these boys, including 30 from Mausi Henry itself, are being engaged by the forest department to do active patrolling duties inside the national park. Now, how much do they get? These 300 people started getting only 1,500 rupees a month. Now it has been increased to 4,000 rupees a month. But is it sufficient? Because these people don't have much of a social security. Because apart from that, 4,000 rupees, they don't have any protection. For the same job, which is done by a forest department guy, he probably gets around 18, 19,000 with all the pensions and security. This guy is much more motivated, but we are not being able to do much for them because, because even the government's hands are tied up. You know, this budget, which is there to support these 300 people at 4,000 4, rupees, is also from a contingency fund which is, uh, of the BTC. And somehow we need to supplement it, even to sustain it at that level. So there's a risk of these 300 people who are already engaged losing what are they are already doing. Then there's this additional pressure, because even in Mausing and out of this 400, only 30 people are getting engaged in this project. So similarly, there are 300 to 350 who are not engaged in this uh, conservation uh, program where di they get directly paid. Similarly, if you multiply it into 1920 other organizations, so there's another 3,000 to 4,000 people who are voluntarily involved in the conservation, not inside but outside in the ca campaign, but they also need to be engaged. So for them, like we have tried to create alternative livelihoods, like the females, you know, have their dance troops, they make their handloom and handicraft, which we try to sell it through a self-help group. This is a group of tourists who are arriving there, the people who are bec uh, you know, becoming guides, and they run the ecolos themselves. But that itself is not very sufficient. Yesterday, somebody asked me a question. Is it a full-time livelihood? Yes, it is not. It is not a full-time livelihood for many of those boys. They do it as a part-time year. But it is the motivation and the hope that at a future date, they will see some better year. So this is where my you know, request to you, all of you, uh, to the platform of TAD, is you know there are these 300 people who are directly engaged, who's who's getting a meager amount, and that is also at risk. There are another 3,000 people who are indirectly involved, 
they need to be sustained in some way. Then there is this community, local people who had, with the masses that the NGOs have spread, they are hopeful that something will happen. I do not know how it will uh, it'll happen, but I'm sure there must be a way. There must be a sustainable way of living, coexisting with the nature and year, and with an earn alternative livelihoods. As TAD members, as speakers, I'm sure all of you are doing well in your own life, in your career. And you would find some reason, some way, where you can connect to this issue and the problem. So my request to you and to the platform today would be, at whatever level you think you can connect or you can do, help not just me or my NGO, to anybody in that area, you're most welcome to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much.